Good morning, everyone. We have to say it. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to uh, week number 26 in our study of the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus the Messiah. And today, as we begin, we're going to begin the same way we ended last week. You will recall last week we had ended up at verse 6 of Revelation chapter 19, and, and we talked about the fact that in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation, the word hallelujah is used four times, and that's the only time it's used in the entire New Testament. But there's something else rather significant about that word. If you take a look at the book of Psalms, and look at the last five Psalms, Psalm 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150, you will note that they begin and end the same way. In English, it's translated, praise the Lord. But all five of those Psalms begin with the Hebrew phrase, hallelujah, praise the Lord. They begin and end that way, and that's a good way for us to begin and end. We are going to praise the Lord because today we're going to be looking at, at some powerful words about what lies ahead. You know, many people tend to think that the book of Revelation is a real downer and, and see it as something that talks about all sorts of disasters. And there's no denying it does talk about the ultimate fate of those who reject the living God from the devil downward. But it is also a very positive and powerful book that reminds us of what lies ahead. You know, Mother Teresa once said that from heaven, the most miserable earthly life will look like a bad night in an inconvenient hotel. And I think that is such a powerful image, isn't it? Because there's no denying we go through times of great struggle and difficulty, and some people go through far more than others. But for all of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, who have experienced the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, who know the love of the Father, this life is but a drop in the bucket compared to forever. And what God has in store for us forever is so good, it is beyond our ability to even fully comprehend at this point. And so on that note, let's begin with prayer today, and then let's dive right back into Revelation 19. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are good. We thank you for the way you have provided for our salvation through the promised Redeemer, the Messiah of Israel, the hope of the nations, our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, whom you have poured out on those who believe. And we pray this day, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill each of us to overflowing, that you would give us wisdom from above, hope that descends from your throne, and assurance that comes through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the promise of his imminent return. We praise your name, Lord. We just simply begin by saying, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 19, we're going to pick up where we had left off last week at verse 6. And uh, this is what John saw. He says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. We are coming now to the conclusion of the book of Revelation. Chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22 bring to a final conclusion all the visions that John has seen as Jesus first appeared to him on the Isle of Patmos. And now we are seeing final victory. And the picture is a glorious one. And the sound from heaven is resounding through these words. And then John goes on to say, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Now, that is a particularly powerful image. And it is a profoundly biblical one. Let me give you some examples, if I may. From the Hebrew scriptures, from the writings of the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 54, we read these amazing words from God. 
This is what the Lord says. Isaiah 54, I'm going to start at verse 5. The Lord says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young only to be rejected, says your God. And what God is saying, our Creator is saying, He is our husband. He is wholly committed to us. You know, it has been said that a good Christian marriage is one of the closest things there is to heaven on earth. It's it's also been said that a bad marriage is one of the closest things there is to hell on earth. But God describes himself as the husband of his people. He loves us. He is faithful. He will never, never leave or forsake us. And what he invites us to is to experience a relationship with him that never ends. What is significant here is now that very real biblical image straight out of the Hebrew scriptures is applied to Jesus. And he is described as the one, as the bridegroom, in effect. And when he returns, it is his wedding feast that we will celebrate And again, this image is a rich image that is found throughout the scriptures. Think about it in the New Testament, for example. What was the first miracle that Jesus performed? The answer, John chapter 2, the wedding at Cana. He turned about 150 gallons of water set aside for purification purposes into grade A, class A wine, five-star stuff. I mean, it it, it wasn't Boone's Farm, Strawberry Ripple. No, this is good stuff. This is California and and French wine at its best, you know. And, And Jesus performs that miracle that some people look upon as being rather frivolous. Why would he do that as his first miracle? Why not heal someone? And the answer is in that miracle, he is showing Messiah has arrived. Because Messiah... Messiah will bring in the very things that the Father promised in the Hebrew Scriptures. The marriage feast. The the ultimate destiny of his people. Jesus performs a miracle miracle at a wedding to show that he is the bridegroom. And, And he speaks of that on repeated occasions in the New Testament. On one occasion, Jesus was asked, how come the disciples of John fast and your disciples don't? And Jesus says, when the bridegroom is with them, they celebrate, in effect, is what he says. When the bridegroom is taken away, then they'll fast. In other words, sorrow will come at his death. But There will be celebration at his resurrection. And what we are looking forward to is the marriage feast of the Lamb. Jesus told a parable during the final days of his ministry in Matthew chapter 25 about the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. And what were they doing? They were waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus said to his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will bring you back so that you may be where I am. The image is the image of what was happening in Jesus' day and what continues to happen in the Middle East. And that is... When a bridegroom is betrothed to his future bride, he goes back to his home and he builds an addition on his father's house. And the addition, when completed, will be the house for his bride. And he will come to her and bring her to himself. And those are the images that we have here. You know, if you think about it, too, it's a glorious image. Uh, You know, wedding celebrations can be so enjoyable and fun. And the marriage feast of the Lamb is going to be all of the fun and none of the frustration. 
and none of the worry and preparation and, and craziness that comes as you're getting ready for a wedding. Instead, it is going to be joy forever. I think Mother Teresa was absolutely right when she said, in contrast to what lies ahead, you know, even the most miserable of human lives is just the equivalent of a bad night in an inconvenient hotel. And what the scripture is saying is that for you and for me and all who know the Lord and long for the day of his appearing, this will turn everything around. There is no denying in the book of Revelation and in our lives, there are difficult, painful, horrific things that happen. But what we are looking forward to will so far outstrip those things that we will rejoice forever. And hallelujah, praise the Lord, will reign. Well, John goes on. He then says, verse 7, excuse me, verse 8 rather, fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. You know, there too we have a very important scriptural teaching. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. But as we've said before, that is never alone. And what God desires is that his people grow in righteousness, in faithfulness, in maturity, in holiness. We are called to grow up in our faith. We're not to remain little children. We are to have the faith of a little child, but we are to be grown up when it comes to living upright, God-pleasing lives. And that is not an option. It doesn't save us, but because we're saved, it naturally flows from it. And so then John continues, and he says this. He says, then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. You can always count on what God says. His word is always true. It is always faithful. It will always be fulfilled, even when it seems impossible. Because why? With God, nothing is impossible. And so John hears from an angel who says, those who are truly blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And, and Jesus offers that invitation to each of us. And I might add, if, if you are not yet his follower, if you've just tuned in to see what's going on here, or if you've been following all along and you're still conflicted and questioning, I'd like to invite you to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Because you see, the invitation is given to all. And, and what the scriptures declare is that God loves not just good religious people, God loves the world. Uh, interestingly enough, Jesus had the most trouble with good religious people. <laughs> but what God desires, people who are humble before him, who freely admit, I'm a sinner, I need a savior. And when we come to him that way, he gives us a personal engraved invitation. And he says, welcome. You're invited. Come on in. He invites us to be with him forever. And that is something that each of us receive by faith. And I advise, invite you, if you haven't yet received him, this would be a real good time to do that. Because there is a great feast that awaits us and it will never end. Well, John continues then, and this is what he writes. He says, at this, I fell at his feet to worship him, meaning the angel. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. Love those words. And again, they are profound words that reflect everything the Bible teaches all along. Namely, God alone is worthy of our worship and praise. We are not to worship people. 
We are not to worship things. We are not to worship demonic spirits. We are to worship only the living God and God alone. And it's very instructive to note that not only here in the book of Revelation, but throughout the scripture, when angels appear to people and the people desire to worship them, the angels say, don't do it. There is one, though, in the scripture who never turned away worship. And that's the Lord Jesus. And we read on numerous occasions in the New Testament the people fell at his feet and worshiped him. And he didn't say, stop it, worship only God. Why is that? <laughs> and the answer is because he is the living God come to earth. The word, the scripture says, the word, by the way, the scripture, which is true, the true word of God that we read just a moment ago, the living word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the way the Gospel of John begins. And Jesus receives worship because he is worthy of worship. And in fact, as we get to these final chapters of the book of Revelation, we will see him being worshiped. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive praise, power, authority, worship. But John is told, worship only God. And then these very fascinating words, they're difficult to translate, but I love the way the NIV has rendered them. Worship God, that's clear, for it is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, the Holy Spirit who inspires the prophetic word from God. It is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. What did Jesus say to his disciples on the night that he was betrayed? He said, it is good for you that I leave. Because when I leave, the Father will send the Holy Spirit. And what will he do? He will testify to me, Jesus says. And here we have something very similar to that in these powerful words. Well, John, again, does not stop here. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. This is the final victory. This is the end of the battle that has been raging since the Garden of Eden. And it is also interesting that as we have been discussing over these past weeks, you know, various interpreters, how they have understood the book of Revelation. Was it fulfilled in the first century? Is it something that continues to be fulfilled today? Is it something for the future? Is it a broad basic principle of life until the return of Jesus, everybody pretty much agrees on this. Who is the rider on the white horse who's called faithful and true? The answer is it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it continues as we read on. We read verse 12. It says, his eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. That, by the way, is where the great hymn, crown him with many crowns, comes from. His, his eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. Jesus is the one who reveals his identity. He is dressed in a robe dip, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. And, and there again, you think of John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is an affirmation of the deity of Jesus. Verse 14, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And then John says, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. By the way, that is a direct quote from Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is one of those great messianic psalms that the rabbis recognized all along. 
Why do the nations rage and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed one? The Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah. He will rule them, the psalm goes on to say. Psalm 2 verse 9 with an iron scepter. This comes directly out of the Hebrew scriptures. And as we've seen all through the book of Revelation, this is anchored in the Old Testament scriptures. And then it says, he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And again, it is an image taken right out of the writings of the prophet Isaiah, who describes the final victory that God brings forth and that God himself wins. And there's a, a great old hymn that goes like this. Who is this who comes from Edom, all his garments stained in blood? It's right out of Isaiah 63. He comes from winning the battle over sin, death, and the devil. And the blood is the blood of the lamb who was slain for us. It is the blood of the final victory. And so the scriptures continue on, whoops, what happened there? Why? I'll tell you what, I'm going to unplug this for just a second and see if we can bring this back up. Well, I'll tell you what, obviously it doesn't want to cooperate. So we will just continue without the slides for a moment here. You know, there's a life lesson here. Things don't always go as well as you've planned them. And, and I just like to say, I have some wonderful slides to share with you this morning, but obviously they're just, they're just not going to come up. So we're not going to let the enemy win. We're just simply going to go with what the word of God has said. And so that's where I'm going to pick up now in uh, verse 16. It says, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. Again, if you had any doubt as to who the rider on the white horse was, this makes it pretty obvious. He is the king of kings and Lord of lords. He is the Lord Jesus himself. And so John says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. And I freely admit to us in the 21st century, that sounds ugh. But what it is depicting is absolute and total victory. This is not a negotiated settlement. This is pure, final total, absolutely complete victory. Thank you, Lord. And on that note, let's move on because the victory's coming. And so here is what the scripture says. Verse 19, then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Again, the picture is total and complete victory. It's the kind of thing that little boys may read and say, ooh, that looks good. And us adults look at it and say, whoa, that sounds really, really rugged. But what the Lord is communicating is this. As powerful as the enemy may seem today, as vicious as his tactics are, as many as he has deceived and deluded, in the end, he loses and God wins. It's just that simple. And the final victory is ours. And that just rings out so loudly from chapter 19. You know, God wins. We win. 
because of the Lord Jesus Christ, through faith in him, through trust in the living God, we win. And the victory is ours because the victory is his. And so it's on that note that we come to what is one of the most controversial chapters in the whole book of Revelation. And it's what we have up here on the screen. 1000 or millennium. Millennium is based on two Latin words that mean a thousand years. And in the book of Revelation chapter 20, we have the only mention in all the Bible of the quote unquote millennium, the thousand years. And what is so fascinating about this is that although as we have been studying the book of Revelation, we have noted there are four major views that have been held over the centuries by devout and, and faithful believers. When it comes to chapter 20 and the millennium, those four different groups are all over the map. <laughs> because when it comes to this, some who hold to the preterist view are premillennial, others are postmillennial, and others are amillennial. When it comes to the millennium, those who call themselves futurists, some are premillennial, some are postmillennial, and some are amillennial. When it comes to those who are individuals who are historicists, some are premillennial, some are postmillennial, some are amillennial. When it comes to those who are idealists, some are pre-post and amillennial, and you can find them everywhere. That's one of the reasons I've joked at the very beginning of this class with a phrase that I first heard from the late Dr. Walter Martin. I am a pan-millennialist. It will all pan out in the end. But what we're going to be doing next week is taking a look at these various views. I want to be very honest with you too. Over the years, I've had some pretty set views on how to interpret the millennium. I will also be honest. The more I read the scriptures, the more I'm uncertain about my set views. I, I, I believe, first of all, I believe that God is far smarter than any of us. And we need to be humble as we approach him and as we approach his word. I know something else. At the first appearing of Jesus, everything about him was predicted in the Hebrew scriptures, but no one truly understood it until after his resurrection and after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then people just simply said, wow, yeah, that, it's been there all along. I would not be surprised if the same thing happens at his second appearing. All of our fancy arguments, our, our strong beliefs that have been ardently defended, we will probably end up saying, oh, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and honor and praise and riches and wealth. And, and we will say, we bow before him in humility and in awe. I believe the scriptures predict what is to come. I also believe we probably won't be able to figure it out until it gets here. And so on that note, we're gonna end this morning. Next week, we're gonna pick up with the study of the millennium. I, I've already got it prepared, by the way, and I'm just gonna run through it real quickly there. And uh, we will take a look at that next time. But right now, I'd like to close with prayer, and I'd also like to remind you of something special coming up next week as well, okay? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you that the victory has been won and that we, by faith, will receive all of the fruits of Jesus' victory. Lord, draw us to yourself. Fill us anew each day with your Holy Spirit that we may live holy lives that give you glory and call others to a knowledge of the living God. Amen. Amen. Well, next week, 
April the 13th, we're going to have live Q&A once again. I'd invite you to uh, submit your questions if you haven't already done so. And uh, we will be picking up at the end of next week's class with uh, the questions that have been submitted. We're getting close to the end of the book of Revelation, so it's a good time to get those questions in. I'd invite you to join us then next time, same time, same place. Uh, God be with you all, and uh, have a wonderful day. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.